Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first guest lecture of the series. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Liederer. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Machine Learning at ETH Zurich, and previously he did his PhD at TU Munich. And his research focuses on probabilistic machine learning for modeling and control of autonomous robots and cyber-physical systems. It's based on uh, both theoretical um, uh, rigorous math and algorithms in order to uh, blend them together for methods that are safe for real world practical systems, which is um, a very a big topic of interest, both in this class and I think more generally. Uh, he has said that you are welcome to interrupt him throughout the talk with questions. I will be monitoring the chat. So if you prefer to write in the chat, I will do the interruption or you're welcome to unmute yourself uh, and interrupt uh, yourself. And with that, uh, Harman, please go ahead and share your screen and let's begin. Uh, screen is shared? Oh, uh, yes, it is, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, then thanks for the, the great introduction. Uh, and I, I don't want to uh, waste any time and directly go into the topic uh, of safe model-based control with Gaussian processes. And for the motivation of that, I want to start with two application examples that we considered um, during my time as a PhD student in Munich. Uh, the first one is autonomous underwater vehicles. And... Uh, there, within one project, um, we try to grasp some um, objects, in this case litter, from the ocean floor. And as you can imagine, this is quite a challenging problem to uh, perform autonomously with an underwater vehicle. The dynamics of the uh, vehicle are hard to describe using first principle models, um, because in general we have, would have to consider fluid dynamics to describe them very accurately. Uh, we have external effects uh, from ocean currents uh, when we go into the sea. Um, we have uh, nasty nonlinear effects when we come close to the, um, uh, the, the ocean floor where the thrusters, uh, water streams are reflected from. Uh, so it's really hard to describe that. And on the other hand, we need to, to manage this task in a few trials. Um, because uh, we cannot take forever uh, to train a, uh, our model, our controller, just to grasp one object, but we have to do that fast. We have to do that uh, very flexible in a data efficient uh, manner um, and ideally online to succeed in such a task. Um, the other application that I, I we considered was um, rehabilitation robotics, which can be done like here on the left, using an, an exoskeleton. Uh, what we can also do is we can use functional electrical stimulation, where basically the idea is to use the human hand or the human arm as the actuator and use the electrical pulses that we send into the muscle to actuate um, or to make the, the muscle contract. Uh, and in both systems, you can imagine, it's extremely hard to, to model them because we don't know how to describe humans using um, parametric models, so it's very hard to do that. Um, on the other hand, we have um, limitations in, in terms of the number of data we have available for each um, patient, because they want to do their exercises for rehabilitation, but they don't want us to, to give their data in the, in, the in the first place. So we have a limited interaction time with them, and finally, uh, safety is really critical in these scenarios when we deal with uh, people that are impaired because of diseases or, or injuries. We don't want to, to uh, bring them in any more risk than we have to. So when we design an algorithm, uh, it needs to be absolutely safe in, in such a scenario. Um, the way we try to approach this is using uh, a model-based control design uh, for which we use a, a model that's learned online or sorry, that in general that's learned using data from the system. So we, we kind of have here, uh, in, in addition to the nominal, nominal control loop, we have an additional loop that goes through the data um, that's generated by the system. Uh, the advantages of, of such a formulation are that on the one hand, we can, we can do online adaptation very easily because we just have to change our dynamics model here. And based on that, our model-based controller will automatically adjust. And on the other hand, we have the advantage that we can deal with non-episodic problems uh, where we don't have to repeat the same task over and over again uh, because uh, we can just do, conti do continual learning in parallel to running the controller here. Uh, what I haven't specified so far is what we use here to learn the dynamics model. And as, as you might have inferred from the title of the talk, uh, I want to use here Gaussian processes. 
and um, there are again different reasons why why we prefer them in, in the scenarios that we that are described. Um, on the one hand, they provide us with an explicit representation of the uncertainty, and this is, is really nice because it, it allows us to make our systems more cautious uh, when the model uncertainty is high, uh, which is a significant advantage compared to um, other approaches like classical parametric modeling or neural networks. Um, on the other hand, they are ideally suited for such online learning scenarios that we have here. Um, because we can uh, sequentially update these models, meaning every time we get a new data point, we update this model and directly get the new model along with all the, the safety guarantees uh, so we don't have to uh, have a large overhead in terms of computations for, for that. Uh, when we think about such a, a control design approach where we, uh, which we compose of a, a learning block and a model, based control law block, um, we uh, have uh, multiple aspects to consider. On the one hand, classical control theoretic ones, uh, which usually deal with the, with the question, how can we ensure safety? How can we ensure stability of the, of the control loop? Um, on the other hand, we need to take into account data-centric uh, perspectives. Um, for example, we somehow need to get the data and the data should be informative for our model to get the high accuracy, um, such that we can actually um, perform well in the control task that we consider. And finally, we have algor an algorithmic perspective that we need to consider because when we want to bring these algorithms onto a real world system, we need to make them computationally efficient enough to, for them to run um, in, in with, with the real time constraints that we usually have on, on um, these systems like underwater robots or um, robotic rehabilitation setups. And Whenever we, we would change something in either of the blocks, we have to consider the interaction with the other ones because we, for example, don't want to lose our safety guarantees just because we make an approximation to get our um, learning component faster. Uh, and around these three core aspects, I, I want to center my talk today, starting um, with a, a brief introduction of uh, Gaussian process regression and how can, we can get uh, data-dependent learned error bounds for, for Gaussian processes. Based on these learning error bounds, I want to talk about uh, uncertainty-sensitive control guarantees, mainly in, in the sense of Lyapunov stability today. Um, this uncertainty uh, sensitivity allows us to look more into the question how we should generate our data such that we can actually guarantee an improvement of performance when we get more and more data. And finally, uh, how we can really get that onto real world systems by using scalable online learning approximations, which maintain these um, learning error guarantees that we uh, originally started with in the first part of the talk. So let's directly go into the, the, the first part and talk, uh, look into Gaussian process regression. Um, I don't wanna start here with the e common equations that you would see in, in many talks, but instead I wanna uh, start with uh, linear regression, uh, but from a Bayesian perspective. And the, the idea in, in Bayesian linear regression is that we put a prior on our weight vector here. And, um, and usually this prior is, is Gaussian. Then we assume that our uh, observation noise is also following a Gaussian distribution. And that allows us uh, to use Bayes' law to get the posterior distribution of our weights given some data set composed of training inputs and training targets. And uh, in this, uh, this Bayes' law, we again put in here the prior for our weights. We put here the probability for our data, which is uh, dependent on the, on the structure here together with the observation, observation noise. And we have a normalization constant in the denominator. Um, this is basically, since everything uh, is, is, is Gaussian in this setting, we can explicitly compute the posterior distribution uh, for, for the weights here. And it's, it can be shown that um, the, this distribution is Gaussian again, and uh, has this mean vector and this covariance matrix. And these are basically equations you can find in, in every textbook. So, so far, it's it's only linear regression, and the question might be, what can we do with that? Uh, and, and many of these ex examples have shown you uh, linear regression itself might not be suitable in, in this form. But what we can always do is, instead of using the training inputs here directly, we can lift them to a higher dimensional feature space um, using some feature map uh, phi here. 
and then consider a linear model of this form. And essentially nothing changes, but we can still do this linear Bayesian region regression. And we can also directly write down here our functions so that we would get to our posterior mean function and a posterior variance function. And they have these rather bulky expressions, but again, uh, you can compute that in closed form. And it's, it's just a little bit of linear algebra to, or, or to, to, uh, to, you know, you can code that in one light of, of any program language you want, basically. Um, so this is very nice. And in, in, in certain settings, we also know how to construct these, these features, for example, using physical knowledge, but in general, um, it might not be possible to, to find these features. So the question is, can we avoid them? And the, the key trick here is now that instead of working with the features directly, we define a kernel um, and, and this is basically just the product of the features uh, together with the uh, covariance matrix of the pri uh, weight prior. And this kernel is always a scalar function depending on two arguments, regardless of how many features we have here. And in fact, we can even take an infinitely large number of, of features here, uh, and it still will be a scalar function. So this allows us to now to, to do linear regression in infinitely dimensional feature spaces because we can completely rewrite the equations for the posterior mean function and the posterior variance functions uh, in terms of this, uh, this kernel. Uh, and you will get these equations here, will you which you will find in most papers, in most books about Gaussian process regression. But in the end, you can imagine this just as, as doing this linear regression in an arbitrary large feature space, possibly infinite dimensional. So in a very nice theoretical concept, but how do we get this infinite dimensional feature map? Uh, and this is something uh, that has been looked into in, in literature for, for quite some time now. Um, and the, the key answer is uh, we directly specify a kernel, for example, the square exponential kernel here. And then we look into uh, how the corresponding features would, would look like. And um, since we cannot compute them, all of them anyways, we just try to describe the corresponding uh, function space. And for example, for the square exponential kernel here, we can show that the corresponding function space is um, the, the space of analytic functions. So functions we can infinitely often differentiate. And now we can basically do the regression of arbitrary functions in this feature space by just using this kernel function here. And the kernel here is completely specified by two, two simple types of parameters. We feel the signal variance and some length scales, and they somewhat affect how the prior behaves. Now, given some training data, we can do exactly as before in the linear region regression setting. And at every test point, we get our mean function comes closer to what our unknown true function looks like and our variance collapses, not completely, but to a small value where we have some measurements. The intuition behind the, the result that we get uh, this posterior distribution is that we can use the posterior mean function now as a model of the unknown function that we try to learn and we can use the posterior variance as a measure of model uncertainty that we, uh, we have for our unknown function. And as you can see here, this is also uh, pretty accurate. Uh, when we don't have any data points, our uncertainty is rather high. So we, we just say we don't know how the function will look like here exactly. We can even go a step further um, because we know that at each test point, our distribution is going to be Gaussian. So we can use tail bounds to basically uh, bound, the, uh, the, bound the probability that the value is larger than uh, a certain distance away from the mean function. Uh, this distance is completely described by the posterior uh, variance then. If we now do that for a lot of points and additionally exploit the, the knowledge that this mean function for the GP uh, and the variance function are going to be Lipschitz constants for a large number of um, kernel functions. We can do interpolation between these artificial points that we considered, and by that get an error bound that holds uh, jointly over the whole impact domain. So 
uh, we get an, an error bound that is itself dependent on 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 the input training in, uh, the, the test input x, but this bound holds jointly over the whole uh, domain we consider. A little more mathematical. Um, this looks like this here, where we take the difference between the unknown function and the mean function, and this difference is bounded by a constant multiplied with the standard deviation of the GP. And then this bound holds for a compact domain jointly with probability one minus delta. If we take this Bayesian approach, like here, we can easily compute this parameter as square root of beta, and it only depends on Lipschitz constants. So uh, again, it's a, it's a few lines of code uh, until we get to this parameter, but it's, it's really not something uh, challenging to, to do in practice. Now, the key motivation, uh, this, one, one one key issue that we we have left is the hyperparameters that we had to specify for the kernel, and this is to some extent a, a problem because what we usually do is we optimize them using something called maximum likelihood um, estimation. But when doing that, uh, we get a very good mean function, uh, and the the um, posterior variance tends to be overconfident. So our error bound in a lot of cases might not hold because uh, our, our, our hyperparameters are too too confident. Um, what we came up with to, to overcome this issue to some extent is uh, putting a prior on the hyperparameters themselves and then searching basically in this uh, confidence set that we get for the hyperparameters that would give us the, the worst posterior variance. And we use that only to compute the we use that only to compute the the standard deviation here in the error bound, but we leave the mean function unchanged. So basically, we we keep the good performance that we have from maximum likelihood to to determine our our nominal model, but our uncertainty estimate gets conservative to account for the fact that we don't know the true hyperparameters. Uh, we tried that out on, on some real world data um, where, for example, uh, the Sarkis data set, which is um, um, data of the Sarkis robot arm with roughly 45,000 samples. And uh, we can see when we only use, uh, when we only use uh, 850 data points, there is still um, a relevant number of, of uh, violations of our error bound. But we, when we increase the number of training data, um, it significantly reduces. Uh, in contrast to the likelihood optimal approach, which still has uh, an extremely high violation of the, um, the, of the error bound. Uh, nevertheless, since we use exactly the same uh, mean function as the likelihood optimal approach, we don't suffer any disadvantages uh, in, in regression accuracy. So this is uh, uh, a big step to, towards uh, safety, ensuring safety for, for um, really cr crucial applications like um, a standard water example, or uh, robotic rehabilitation, where we need these practical safety guarantees. May May I just um yeah. then and make sure I understand? So you're and because I'm I'm not a total expert on G. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, you have an unknown function, and yes. uh, know that you're searching within some class that's uh, that's defined by this kernel. Yes. And the yes. kernel has some parameters in it that that describe you know how quickly the function changes over time and things like yes. this. Yes. Yes. And you're saying that uh, the way that you choose the parameters of that kernel typically is this maximum likelihood estimation that gives you a very good mean estimate of what the function is, but has too tight error bounds often. Yes. It's overconfident yes. in the structure of the function compared to what you often see in practice. And so instead, you want to keep the mean the same using the maximum likelihood, but for the error bounds that you're going to put on the GP, you're going to uh, choose the parameter that gives you the most uncertain confidence bounds, bounds essentially, and yes, then so that's you kind of as your uncertainty. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Very interesting. And uh, yes. is this a, a general approach, or is it for certain types of kernels or classes of system? Um, yeah, there is uh, theoretically there is some restriction in terms of kernels. Um, there is a, as far as I remember, a technical assumption. Um, uh, that requires some some form of monotonicity to for for for, for that to work. Mm -hmm. um, I think in practice it did not have, uh, at least for the kernels we tried, uh, it did not show any practical relevance. 
But uh, I, I think we also just tried for for matching class kernels and square exponential kernels. So I I I cannot say how how applicable it would be, for example, to um, linear kernels or something like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions so far? Okay. I had a quick question. Sorry, yes. I don't know if you're able to hear me well. Um, yes. Those Lipschitz constants. Are those things that you know a priori from the kernel, or are they something that, that might depend on the actual system? Um, yes, yeah, so the Lipschitz constant for the posterior variance generally depends only on uh, uh, the kernel. Uh, the Lipschitz constants for the posterior mean function will depend on the data. Cool. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, then I'll continue. So now we have this this uh, nice uh, error bounds, but the original problem was that we wanted to learn dynamical systems. Um, so when we have a continuous time dynamic system described by a differential equation, uh, what we basically do is we concatenate the state x and the control input u into a vector of uh, training inputs. Uh, we take the temporal derivative of the state as training targets, and then we can do Gaussian process regression with that. Uh, in a lot of practical applications, of course, we will have a, a multidimensional state, and therefore uh, x dot will also be vector valued. And the, the most commonly used approach to deal with this issue is simply use one Gaussian process per uh, dimension of the training targets. Um, and in practice, this is really uh, something that, that has uh, that, that, that has been shown to work quite well. Um, there are more sophisticated approaches uh, to that, uh, which you can usually find under terms like multi-output GPs, um, but this goes too far. So I, if you're interested more in that, uh, I can I can give you some reference to look into. If you... uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is, is that you can encode um, structural prior knowledge into the kernel design and uh, one that is particularly important and that I will also use later in the talk is that of controller fine systems where the system dynamics are described by a drift term and this uh, function g of x that's multiplied with the control input. And what we would ideally like to have is that our mean function also decomposes into the structure because that uh, will allow us to, to apply the control design techniques uh, that we know for the control of fine systems class also to the, the GP model. And it can actually be, show, be shown pretty straightforwardly um, when we put independent priors, for, uh, independent GP priors on F and G, that the corresponding kernel must look like this, where we have one kernel for the function F, one for the kernel for the function G, and the kernel for the function G is multiplied with u from uh, u and u dash. Um, so this kind of reflects the structure that we have here when we only have measurements of x dot. Even though we don't measure the individual functions in the Bayesian setting, we can get error bounds for um, the uh, accuracy of learning f and g independently, which is a pretty nice property and also something um, that we exploit later. In general, I have only shown you a very small area of this research that is going on in, in that direction, and there is a lot more. Um, in particular, what you will find in a lot of papers is that they use frequentist bounds that usually rely on the reproducing kernel the Hilbert space that comes along with the kernel and certain form of concentration inequalities to deal with the observation noise. Um, on the other hand, there are... Uh, more recent uh, papers that uh, try to give deterministic error bounds in a setting where you have bounded noise. So uh, you can do more, classic, more classical robust control approaches with uh, the resulting models that you get. Um, something that is a bit of a more open question in this context is how to deal with no um, noise on the, on the training inputs, which is uh, an important question in, in such a setting since when the, the measured states that we would have from a real physical system 
are most certainly also affected by some measurement noise. Um, and at least theoretically, uh, it's there are only a very few approaches how to deal with that. And in my opinion, not really convincing ones. So there is some work left to be done. Um, on the other hand, I, I only sp spoke very briefly about um, how we can model these systems with GPs. But there is uh, a lot of recent work on how to bring physical priors into GP models. And uh, the core theory that is, is, that is exploited in this context um, is often that um, applying a linear operator to your GP results in the GP again. And this allows that we can um, get Euler-Lagrangian GP models. We can get um, Porter Melatonian GP models, and I believe there are also uh, many other opportunities we have uh, using this this uh, formulation. Um, um, another uh, direction that is is um, existing in, in research is um, learning output models, and not uh, state uh, state space models. Um, the the kind of the issue there is right now that uh, they rely on variational inference, and um, so to the best of my knowledge, there are no guarantees similar to these error bounds for these um, output models that um, exist there in literature. So this is also something that um, is, in my opinion, a very important open question in uh, in this context. Um, so far to uh, Gaussian process regression and the learning error bounds. Now let's look a little bit more into the control context uh, and how we can get um, error bounds uh, for our controllers. And what I will mostly exploit in this talk is Lyapunov stability theory. So I wanna give a very brief uh, recap on, on that. And um, for the moment, we assume that we are given some controllers, some policy pi, such that we can write down the closed loop dynamics. But we don't know the, uh, and, and also let's assume for the moment now that we know the function f. Then we know if there exists a function v such that the temporal derivative is negative except for the origin and the function itself is positive except for the origin, then the system is going to, uh, going to be stable. And um, intuitively, this means if we uh, look at the gradient of the Lyapunov function multiplied with the dynamics, they need to. To decay, so we end up in the in the origin, which is the uh, minimum of the Lyapunov function. As long as we know the dynamics uh, for each test point, we can check this condition pretty straightforwardly. Um, but as soon as we get to the scenario where we don't know the dynamics anymore, it gets a little bit more tricky. What we can always do is we can uh, decompose this uh, unknown function f into a known component, the nominal dynamics. And an uncertain uh, component. The nominal dynamics can be, for example, uh, something that we get from uh, our GP mean, mean function, whereas the, the uncertain part here in general is just the residual error that we have. Now, since we have this additivity here, this directly translates into an additivity in the Lyapunov derivative, where we can also decompose it into a, a nominal part and an uncertain part. And then we have um, in order to, to ensure the stability, we can, can think that we need to ensure it uh, in the worst case, uh, which is a paradigm called pessimism in the face of uncertainty. And worst case in this, in this setting means that we take the absolute value here. Um, now, if this pessimistic Lyapunov derivative is going to be negative, then we have the robust convergence, uh, regardless of the actual realization of this uh, V dot uncertain. This is where the, the error bounds for GP regression come in very handy because they allow us to quantify the model error here. So when we use the uh, GP mean function here in the nominal derivative, we can bound the uncertain part using the GP um, error bound using the standard deviation of the GP. And this will give us a bound for the pessimistic Lyapunov derivative that holds jointly for the whole input domain. So when we can ensure that this expression here is negative, then we actually get stability on this convex domain with probability one minus delta, and not just that the Lyapunov derivative condition is satisfied at, at, at a point with probability one minus delta. In addition, we have the nice uh, effect that we have a direct dependency on the data density for our um, guarantee, 
because of the standard deviation here. And we, to some extent, can encode the control task through the Lyapunov function. Then, uh, looking into uh, this condition a little more, we can also see that uh, the, it induces a, a compact set that we are guaranteed to converge to, because basically everywhere around the equilibrium where this condition is not satisfied, we're going to end up, whereas in the region outside where we have, for example, maybe more data, uh, we are going to converge downwards along the Lyapunov function until we end up in this set here. So let's look at an, an, a simple example to, to show you why this uh, uncertainty of our analysis is actually important. And what I used here is a, a inverted pendulum with a feedback linearizing control law uh, that is based on a GP model. And for the GP model, we use here these nine data points. And we try to stabilize the uh, pendulum to the upward position. If we do the nominal analysis where we assume that our um, GP mean function is the true dynamics, what we would always get in such a setting is that the, the resulting closed loop is going to be stable. So let's look how it actually performs when we simulate the system. And it looks good at the beginning, but as soon as you get to the top, it, it over swings and does not come back. So it's definitely not stable um, as the nominal analysis would have said. And this really illustrates why we need to take into account the, the epistemic uncertainty that we have here uh, to avoid such a catastrophic um, misjudgment of the stability. Now, when we do this uncertain aware analysis, what we can actually see is that the pessimistic Lyapunov derivative is positive here on the right side, where we saw the overswinging of the pendulum at the top. And this is simply because we don't have any training data here. So this analysis would have actually told us that uh, it might not be safe to run our controller in, in with such a, a data set available. When we increase the data density, like here on the right, we can see that we can bring down the area where the pessimistic Lyapunov derivative is positive to a small area around the equilibrium. And if we would run the controller in the setting, we would actually see that it stabilizes um, the, um, the pendulum to a position very close around the, the upright position. So this uh, pessimistic approach to, to the um, Lyapunov uh, stability provides us with a very flexible um, analysis and uh, a representation of the sets we're going to converge to. Now, I have only shown you how we can analyze that for a given control law. Uh, and in practice, we most likely would want to design our control law also, control law also based on the GP model. And the, the critical insight there is, um, if we have a given GP model, we cannot uh, really uh, affect the, the uncertain component of the Lyapunov derivative a lot. So the, the main tool that we have available is the nominal Lyapunov derivative. And we need to make sure that this one is negative and ideally sufficiently, uh, sufficiently large in terms of amplitude. But this is, is a rather standard um, control design problem, because this only involves looking at the GP mean function, which is maybe a, a highly nonlinear dynamic, but in general, it's it's a, just a deterministic dynamic. So we can use any control design technique that we have available in our, in our toolkit. And this has been done a lot in the past years. So there are approaches that use backstepping to design controllers based on GP models. There are feedback linearization based approaches to, to the controller design and sliding mode based controllers. So um, I would say almost any method that you can imagine there for the control design, you can apply and a lot of them already have been uh, applied. What is missing to some extent in this context is uh, how we can directly exploit the um, posterior variants of the GP to maybe uh, make the controllers directly more robust um, and not just through the mean function. Um, but there also has been some work um, that I, I do want to mention here because it comes up quite frequency, frequently, and this is um, based on control Lyapunov functions. Um, 
brief recap uh, for control Yapano functions. Uh, usually we assume that we have this controller fine structure and that we know uh, a Lyapunov function V and then we write down um, the, the controller in the form of an optimization problem that we solve online where we try to minimize the control input such that the Lyapunov derivative which we can express through this matrix A and, and uh, vector B here. Uh, so sorry, we, we can we can express two of these parameters A and B that depend on, on the state X. Uh, we write that as a, as a constraint and this will automatically give us a, a controller that is going to be Lyapunov stable because the constraint enforces it. Uh, it turns out that the uh, optimization problem itself is a quadratic problem, so we can solve that quite efficiently um, with numerical tools. Using the pessimistic Lyapunov uh, analysis, we can directly transfer that uh, to our GP models, where we now use uh, nominal GP dynamics defined through the mean function of the GP and have to adapt uh, this uh, parameters A and B um, to using the GP mean function here as well. But since we have to take a pessimistic approach, we additionally get these constraint tightening variables rho f and rho g, and this rho g is multiplied with the absolute value of u. Um, this is not ideal because it is not a quadratic program anymore, but um, problems of this form can be reformulated into the form of a second order cone program, and this can still be solved quite efficiently such that um, it, it works really also in, in applications and in, in practice. Uh, I have shown it here for control Lyapunov functions, but um, this exact approach works uh, for control barrier functions as well, if you want to ensure the safety of uh, the models. In general, what I've shown you so far is, is focused on, on rather simple control architectures where we can do the stability analysis. Uh, but in, you know, when we want to go for these underwater robots, uh, we might not be able to directly do the most exciting tasks with, with that. Um, but the, the, the nice thing is that stability induces error bounds that we can use. Uh, if we go to specific cases, we can actually predict the error bounds we get uh, through that um, into the future for a given reference trajectory so that whenever we have some obstacles or other constraints, we can adapt our reference trajectory to um, avoid these obstacles despite tracking errors. And this can be done, for example, in the form of an optimization problem um, where we formulate an optimal control problem, um, have the constraints that we need to avoid the, the big stone here, this obstacle, and adapt the robustness that we have in our constraint tightening to the tracking error bound that we get from our um, um, GP-based low-level controller. Finally, we solve that in a receding horizon fashion. So basically we implement MPC and what we get is the result is shown in this video where we can predict our um, error tubes in the, into the future around the, the reference trajectory that we have. And uh, we can see that it safely navigates uh, uh, around the big stone here um, because it has this uncertainty awareness in the model, uh, yet still manages to, to, to do a pretty nice performance in reaching the task. Uh, what you can see in blue here is the trajectory that you would get when you would do um, the, the tracking, uh, ignoring the, the, the tracking errors, and it would actually lead to collisions here and here. So it is important in the setting to consider this constraint tightening um, because uh, we would have safety violations that might damage our underwater robot in, in a real experiment. So this combination of low-level control and that adaptive replanning uh, with, with um, adaptive robustness uh, is a pretty nice uh, combination for, for getting these controllers uh, working on more challenging problems. And uh, we're also working on that uh, to get it into real experiments and see how that works there. So far uh, to the control design and uncertainty of our safety guarantees, um, but let's look a little bit more into the training data that we need to actually achieve this, these, these performances. And the, the key point here is again, this error bound that we have for Gaussian process regression. 
which critically depends on the standard deviation of the TP. So what we really need to understand is how the standard deviation depends on the data density and how we should measure, measure data density for such non-parametric models in the first place. One concept that can be found found in, in rather old literature is uh, the fill distance, which basically measures the uh, given the test point. It measures it measures the distance to the closest training input uh, in using a certain kernel dependent metric. And what has been shown thirty years ago basically is when this fill distance decreases, then the posterior variance of the GP also decreases, what you can see here. Um, the, the problem with this kind of is that it does not go to zero here for zero fill distance. And um, this is also not something that we should expect because we deal with noisy training targets. So from a simple a single measurement, we cannot expect that we, we can reduce our uncertainty to zero. What we can do is we can average out this, this, this noise. And this is basically done by considering the distance to the M closest data points instead just a single one. Uh, and that's what we call the, the M fill distance then. And what we can show is that for this offset that we have here for, for zero M fill distance, if we increase M, it actually converges to zero. So we can get a, a posterior variance bound that vanishes um, uh, in, in if we have uh, enough data. Some, some remaining minor issue that we have uh, when we have a fixed data set uh, and just increase M, obviously uh, our distance generally needs to increase. So we might move down here on the offset, but in, 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 in turn, we would move here more to the right of the curve. Uh, so overall, just increasing M might give us a, a worse error bound. Um, that's why we simply define our um, data density measure through the optimal value M star. And uh, this, since this optimization here over M star just requires a, a relatively simple search over integers, uh, it, it does not really pose any problems in, in, in computing in practice. Now, this inverse of the MFL distance can then be used to actually derive um, upper bounds for the posterior variance or posterior standard deviation. And we can show that um, the posterior standard deviation decays with the inverse of the square root of the, this, this uh, data density. So when we have the data density grow to infinity, we will get uh, a zero uh, posterior variance in our GP and basically have the guarantee that we know our model arbitrarily well at any point. Now, this is just a theoretical analysis, completely um, decoupled from control, but it also has relevant uh, implications in, in, in our control loop. And for that, uh, I want to con consider an online learning scenario where we take a new data point every TS seconds and update our GP model with that. Uh, if we do that in a controlled context with a continuous time dynamic, uh, we will get training data that will look somewhat like this. Uh, it's along the, the reference, uh, along the trajectory that uh, was generated by our system. And for these real world systems that we consider, this trajectory is going to be continuous. So we can actually uh, provide bounds on the distance between two uh, sample points here and here in terms of the sampling time that we used to generate the data. Now, this bound on the Euclidean distance in combination with the uh, bound for the posterior uh, standard deviation shown before directly guarantees us that at any point along this, this trajectory, we, we can bound the, the st um, standard deviation of the GP and this bound depends on the sampling time. Using some, some error bounds for certain controllers, um, in, in this uh, example, it's, it's feedback linearization, we can then actually show that we have a tracking error bound that is completely specified through the sampling time and certain parameters of the control law. And we can moreover show that this numerator actually goes to zero when we increase, uh, we, when we, we, we reduce our, our sampling time. So basically, if we could 
that update our GP model arbitrarily fast, we could achieve an arbitrary high tracking accuracy in this in this scenario. We can have even do a little bit more in, in when we, we go into these really specific problems. Um, for example, fix ourselves to a, a square exponential kernel. We can even give decay rates uh, for this tracking error um, in, in, in terms of the sampling time. And as you can see here, this decay rate is a little bit conservative compared to what we actually observe in, in simulations, but uh, qualitatively, it describes the, the, the behavior uh, we see in the sim simulations quite nicely. Um, we try to illustrate these practical advantages of, of online learning uh, in this control context in uh, the uh, rehabilitation robotics example this time, where we used uh, a computer torque control approach that is based on um, parameter estimates of the of the robots uh, of the the um, exoskeleton in combination with the PD controller and uh, apply that with the, uh, low gains for the PD controller in simulation to uh, this human exoskeleton setup. Uh, what you can see here is that there is quite a significant offset between the desired trajectory in green and the actual one executed in red because we have a low level uh, a low gain. A PD controller and it simply does not have enough, um, simply does not provide enough feedback to push it uh, back to the reference trajectory. When we increase the gains a lot and we have measurement noise in there, uh, we get the a little bit exaggerated uh, behavior here where we get a strong chattering behavior because we simply amplify the noise uh, and this has a really bad uh, effect on the controller after all. When we go back to this slow gain controller, but include a GP with online learning in the in the control loop, we see the behavior here, um, where in most regions of the of the state space, we actually have quite a good tracking performance um, because our model continuously updates and uh, adjusts to the measurements it gets. So we this online learning approach really allows us to get um, pretty good performance. Uh, with very little prior knowledge, and uh, in theory, we, we also know if we would update our model, uh, our model faster, we should get even a better performance. So, how how quickly are you updating it here? Um, I think uh, we usually use an update rate around uh, two hundred hertz because uh, that's what we also can do in experiments. Mm. Yeah. Um, lower lower usually also works works fine depending on the application. Um, I think. Everything above 50 in, in, in the scenarios we considered worked uh, reasonably well. Okay. Um, yes. So far, we only used this, this insight uh, from, from the data dependency that we have for the analysis. But the cool thing with GPs is that you can actually also use that for, for design because this online learning provides us with a, a second degree of freedom in our design. We now do not only uh, have the possibility to, to change our controller, but we can also change our, our sampling scheme we generate the data with. And, and this is pretty cool because in the pessimistic Lyapunov stability that, that I, I've shown you before, in the first uh, part, or uh, sorry, in the second part of the talk, we concentrated on this v.num and tried to make that small um, to ensure the, the, the stability. We still need a negative v.num here, but we can, with the, with the online learning, we can also focus on this part here and make sure that this one is sufficiently small. And for that, uh, we simply need to check whenever uh, v.num is equal to the, the error bound that we have here. And when this happens, we we take a measurement, update our GP model. By that, we shrink the variance here, and v dot num is again uh, small enough to ensure that this expression here overall is negative. So this this uh, allows us really to pro provide stability guarantees now through online learning without making any changes to our our controller. And this is also very data efficient, as we can see here in this feedback linearization example, because it only takes the measurements along the trajectory when it needs. Um, in this early uh, regions, when it's relatively far away, it can do that with a, a 
rather low frequency. And when we get to the equilibrium around here, the sampling frequency will increase because we need a lot higher uh, model accuracy to actually stable the um, pendulum to this upright equilibrium position. Again, we can do all of this equivalently for control barrier functions. There's no significant difference there. Uh, and, and this is actually uh, something that uh, people have recently started to work on um, a, a little bit. Um, in general, this whole area of uh, data dependency and, and exploration is something that has not been explored ext a lot. There are um, other, area, uh, other approaches to, to quantify the decay of the, of the variance. Um, usually they are based on a concept called uh, information gain. Um, which tends to give tighter bounds, but also uh, restricts uh, the uh, the user to certain uh, sampling schemes that are typically based on, on optimization-based uh, approaches. Uh, something that I'm not aware of and that I would deem very important are lower bounds in this context, uh, so that we can understand what's actually the best that we can hope for in a learning-based controller uh, in terms of, of, of the data requirements that it needs. Um, another thing that is, uh, is has been done in the in the literature is more on this exploration side. Um, one can formulate this as an um, optimal control, or some form of optimal control problem that we uh, solve, and by bringing in their optimism, one can show that one also gets a form of exploration in this in this context and can derive. Um, bounds on on how fast the the suboptimality. Uh, reduces. Uh, something that is, is kind of a, of a bigger issue in this context still is how we can do that in terms of, of safety, uh, safety constraints and exploration simultaneously, um, because obviously uh, a safety restricts us to a certain um, um, part of the state space, and we need to, to try to expand our, our safe domain, but at the same time, we, we need to uh, stay, uh, remain uh, close to the optimal um, control law, um, and this is something that, uh, especially in the model-based context, um, I'm not aware that there are any solutions to this problem yet. Okay, so now we have all of this theory. Uh, we know in principle how to design the controllers, and we know uh, how we can design our online learning schemes in, in, in principle. So, why don't we just try to, to run all of that uh, on, on, on real hardware? Uh, what you will see is we actually have the issue that for that we need to invert this, this kernel matrix here. And it has a dimension n times n, where n is the number of training samples. So we have a cubic complexity here. And this is it's not just something we can ignore. It's something we will actually see in practice and it, it will uh, cause huge problems because the computation time just explodes. Uh, we will not we will not be uh, be able to uh, to run this GP based controller with uh, ten thousand data points uh, at a kilohertz frequency. So we need to find uh, ways to to avoid this issue. Uh, what we came up with is uh, I would call an algorithmic solution um, called locally growing random tree of GPs. The core idea for that is that we start with a single model based on, on some data set. We collect more and more data over time until we reach a certain threshold in, in terms of uh, number of data points. When we reach this threshold, we split the data into two parts. For each of these two data subsets, we retrain individual models and replace the original model with a division rule. Now this division rule allows us to assign new incoming data to one of these data sets. And again, we update these models until we reach the threshold, split the data and retrain models. Using this iterative approach, we construct a binary tree. And this binary tree has only simple division rules in most of its nodes, except for the leaf nodes where there are the, the GP models uh, together with their data. Now, as long as we can make sure that each of these uh, leaves gets very, very roughly the same number of data points, this tree will grow logarithmically. 
And this immediately induces uh, a logarithmic uptake complexity for this log GP approach. Because we, in, we, we keep the number of data points in, in each model itself bounded. So this is, we can upper bound that by, by a constant basically. How are you splitting the data points? So by region or just? Yes, yeah. So in, in terms, of, in terms of, of updates, it would not matter. We could do anything. Um, the the um, splitting becomes important for the for the predictions, and for that we uh, make almost disjoint regions. Um, the reason for for almost disjoint is uh, we want to have a small overlapping region uh, such that we can guarantee continuity in the end in, in our model. Um, but disjoint models allow us here to look into one node and check which of these two models, or if both of them are active, if one of them, or one of these sites are not active, we can completely ignore the, the other branch. And through, but, but through that, we traverse through the tree, check every time which one is active and kind of have a, a some form of multi-resolution view where we only focus with the higher resolution in the areas uh, around our data point. Uh, whereas everywhere else, we can have a, a very rough perspective and don't have to go through most of the of the of the tree actually. Um, the the key fact now to make this uh, efficient or to give efficiency guarantees is that we need to make these overlapping regions uh, smaller over with with the depth of the tree, and they need to shrink sufficiently fast. So overall, we can we can bound the number of um, um, models that can be active in the in the um, leaf node layer. And if we make sure of that, we can get a log squared complexity for these predictions. Um, since we have multiple GP models active in the end, uh, we have to combine them in, in, in some way. And for that, we usually use some form of aggregation schemes where uh, you, you can, in the, in the simplest form, you can just uh, take the average of the individual GP mean predictions uh, to, to get the aggregation. Um, and that's also where you can see that this overlapping region now, if you consider this um, as, as a weighting region, um, ensures you that you get continuity in your in your model, which is is definitely the advantages when when using them in controllers. So in in terms of complexity, we can we can uh, reduce it from this cubic complexity for exact piece to log complexity for updates and log squared for predictions, and we even keep those um, accuracy guarantees in terms of learning, learning error bounds. Uh, but of course, since we have the aggregation of individual GP models uh, in, in, in the log GP approach, we also have to consider that in the error bound. And we don't have the standard deviation of one GP here, but rather some form of, of um, aggregation. Um, but again, we can easily compute that uh, using the, the, the tree along with the, with the mean prediction. So we have now a computationally efficient method without losing the guarantees. Um, we tried that out on, on, on different data sets, uh, for example, the Sarkis data set again, but also a large one with more than 2 million data points uh, and compared it to, to different um, methods in, in the literature. Uh, and what we can see in, here in, in, in black is our method. Uh, it does more or less the same in terms of, of uh, mean squared error and um, quality of the uh, predictive distribution as other methods. So it's not worse, it's not better, but that's also not what we aim for. Uh, the interesting part comes when we look at the average uh, computation times for updates and predictions. And there we can see that we can do that in uh, this sub millisecond area for, for all of these data sets. So you can see even when we go to two, 2 million data points, the updates, uh, in, in, on average, the, the time does not really change. Um, so we, we really have there a, a scalable method uh, in terms of computation times that does not uh, have, have any uh, problems with de dealing with large data sets. Um, I mean, there are other met methods that, that can deal with that to some extent, but uh, even there, they are more than 10 times slower in the updates. Uh, and this is really the fast uh, we could find in, in the literature. In addition, we have that with theoretical guarantees um, that most other methods do not have. Uh, now, using this this uh, nice results in the in the on, on the real world data, we thought we would go on a real world experiment, and 
yeah, we were quite confident that that it, everything would work out safely. So we uh, picked something where the controller is directly interacting with a with a human. And uh, what you can see in this experiment is um, uh, two linear axes that would move the handlebar um, exactly along the reference trajectory if the human wasn't there. And the human is disturbing this, this system uh, a little bit because he gets imperfect, or he or she gets imperfect feedback through the screen as he only knows the angle he's moving, but not the actual point he's at. Uh, and, and sees only the reference point. And the result that you get is that the GP has to compensate for that. Uh, we run the log GP model there in the background with 200 Hertz updating and, and predicting, and everything uh, runs very smoothly. You don't see any uh, rough behavior. Um, so uh, it, it looks pretty nice. And it also does so when we look more on the data in the, in the user study, where we compared it to a PT controller that was tuned for one participant, and for this, this for this participant, the PT controller and the the GP based controller do roughly the same. Uh, when we go to the user group, uh, some of them they really do not get along with the PT controller tuned for this one person. Uh, obviously, when tuning this this person had a lot of interaction with the problem. He 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 was very good at doing that. Um, and, and some of the, the people uh, did, uh, do this experiment for the first time, and they really did not get a, a, do, do well. Uh, this explained overall the, the larger tracking error and also the higher variance. On the other hand, uh, because the GP is capable for, of adapting online to these people, um, it, it does way better. It reduces the variance and uh, reduces the, the um, mean error in, in the tracking. So we, we do see some, some advantages of this learning-based controllers, even in, in such uh, scenarios where, where the human is involved. This whole approach of using a, a, a graph and, and combining individual GP predictions uh, is very general in principle. So we're not limited to these tree structures. We can also go on arbitrary graphs. And this can allow the uh, application in distributed control with so we can do distributed learning there by combining the gp predictions using consensus methods um alternatively what we can do is uh, nothing forces us to keep all of these uh, nodes on the same computer so especially when we know uh, in, in in these physical systems uh, we cannot jump too far from one time step to another during time uh, if some of these these um, models are active far away, we can transfer them to a, to a cloud and, and store them there, um, do some form of processing there if we want to, uh, because it does not it, it's not going to be needed on, on our local computer. And by that, we can further reduce the computational need, but most importantly, also the needs for memory on the local system by making use of such a, a network architecture uh, that might allow us to, to run this actually on um, hardware that has very low resources, very low memories available. Uh, what I do not want to hide here is that there has been a lot of work on, on scaling GP models to large data sets and the online learning setting as well. Um, I, I'm just mentioning here a few approaches that you can find more frequently in, in control uh, and, and robotics literature probably. Uh, one of them are finite feature approximations, where the key idea is that we go back a step to uh, the origins where I started this presentation. Uh, namely, instead of using the kernel, we try to approximate it using a uh, finite number of nonlinear features, and then we can do Bayesian linear regression with that. And in, in the Bayesian linear regression setting, we just have to update parameters. Uh, so this has a way lower complexity, and the complexity does not depend on the number of training samples. But the theoretical guarantees we get from such approaches are usually significantly weaker compared to um, our method. Uh, another approach that you can commonly find is that, especially in these continuous time control problems, we might not need all the, the global data, but we might be more interested in having just the data around the point our system is currently at. And we don't delete this other data, but we, we make it basically a time varying data set. 
uh, and, and just change the data set over, over time. Um, using that, we can often uh, manage to, to run the controllers with 100 or 200 data points. And with such a low number of data points, it's still fast enough for, for many applications. And, and um, you can actually see a lot of these, these papers that uh, did manage to, to run um, GP-based controllers in real-world experiments. And they use some form of this approximation. Um, what you can find uh, as well are inducing point methods, and they do tend to work very, very well in settings where we have all of the data set available in advance. And there are methods in, in machine learning that allow to scale them also to really large data sets. Um, there have been some propositions to make them um, usable for these online learning problems where we get the data sequentially, but um, in our experiments, we have found them to not work very well and to be significantly slower because uh, it might be necessary to, to adapt or change the using points over time. And this requires solving an optimization problem, which is generally a lot slower than the simple updates that we have in, in these other methods. Uh, overall, this is an area that's very involved. I wouldn't say uh, there are no open problems, but uh, they are very specific and, and uh, very detailed. So I, I, I would not uh, be able to outline uh, all of them here. Uh, but instead, I, I would like to, to point you to a more significant problem in this context, maybe. And this is um, maybe a long-term versus short-term learning, because in the end, all of these approaches focus more on a short-term learning where we try to get a, a, a immediate model that is, is good for the moment, but there is no concept on, on when we should stop learning this model, when we should maybe start learning a completely new model from scratch because something has significantly changed in our environment. Um, maybe some actuator starts to fail or something like this. This is not considered at all in these learning approaches. And I think this is uh, something that has quite some potential uh, for the future that might be worth investigating. Yes, that's also the, the end of my talk, uh, where we started with GP models and I showed you how to get uh, regression error bounds. Then uh, I showed you how we can use Lyapunov stability, uh, Lyapunov stability theory and it's extended to these uncertainty aware uh, control guarantees. Uh, based on these, we looked into these triggering schemes um, that we designed to get uh, performance improvement guarantees. And finally, on a, a scalable, methods to make them uh, applicable in real world experiments and make them fast enough for that. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any further questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I guess I, I will start off uh, first and then we can ask uh, others. Uh, so if a, a student is interested in trying to do some safe learning, safe control, and they have some uncertainty, uh, and they're trying to decide if uh, GPs are the right method to go about uh, doing this. In what scenarios would you say, yes, this is absolutely the right thing, uh, versus when would you say, no, do not use a GP for this situation? Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, question. Um, so I, I would say the it, it takes quite some time to to get to the stage where you can actually run something with the with the gp based uh, controllers um that's something i also underestimated for for quite some time because you need to have a lot of different parts that you get working simultaneously um and it's definitely not going to to be worth it for for very simple problems where you can use parametric models to actually uh, do the job as well um so if you if you have some parametric prior knowledge, uh, for example, or if you have already a very good model of your of your dynamics, there's no point in 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 using the the GP usually. It's it's really in in, in scenarios where you it's super hard to 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 model them. Um, in, in these underwater robotics examples, for example, uh, I think none in our nobody in our lab would know how to 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 model certain effects there. Uh, so there it comes in like a very practical tool for us to 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 just deal with that in terms of data. And then it's also worth the engineering effort you have to put in to get it working in the end. 
Okay, so so very relevant. My next question, which was going to be, uh, so my naive understanding of implementing GP stuff is if you put in just the the simplest GP for your problem, then it won't be very scalable, and yes. uh, you might need to spend a lot of time figuring out the kernel and the hyperparameters that accurately um, uh, represents your your system, and so. Uh, like you were just saying, to actually get it to the point where it's working in a scalable, good manner requires a lot of, um, you know, engineering knowledge, knowing the people to help guide you on on the path, et cetera. Uh, for someone who who has identified that this is the right thing for their problem, um, do you have any reflections, recommendations on how to go about uh, getting trained up uh, or accessing the right code bases for, for doing yeah. it? Um, so there are uh, <clears throat> so some some of these these approaches are are super easy to implement actually. I think this uh, this finite feature approach with with uh, random Fourier features it's like five lines of code or so. Um, so this is something you can super easily implement yourself. Uh, for a lot of other things, there is is, is good um, good code online. Um, we so for 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 our method the, the code can be found online uh, and, and you can just uh, i think it's available in, in python and matlab and there's a simulink block as well for that uh so we were uh, hoping to to make that easily usable for for uh, people that also don't have the background in, in gps um i think in simulink you don't even have to do any coding you can implement uh, put in everything in in in, in 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 a mask that opens up um there are, for for certain things, uh, the 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 MATLAB toolbox that there is for GPs is is relatively easy to use. Um, if you prefer Python, um, there is a, a toolbox called uh, GPyTorch uh, that's been developed mainly from uh, Cornell and NYU, I think. Um, and they have um, a lot of code there. Uh, it's not so much tailored to online learning. But um, for 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 dealing with large data sets in in, in general, um, and for for that I would say um, these are the best methods you can find anyways in 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 papers that, that they have implemented there. Um, so there is is quite some some work on 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 that, uh, and one does definitely not have to implement everything from from scratch. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like you have a question in the chat. Could you take a quick? Yes. One? Um, it says from short term versus long term topic. You mentioned how we would know when to stop learning. Say a particular parameter has entirely changed or something. But say if there's a sudden change in the parameter, won't we know that from the cost of the function or a sudden change in objective function values and use that to stop learning and change the approach? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I I wouldn't say that it's 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 um, impossible to do that or 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 super challenging. Um, but I think it just hasn't been been done. Um, in in principle, you would also or you should also be able. You have this model and you have these error bounds, and you know that they are supposed to hold. So you could do a statistical test or something as well to just check if 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 they are violated, and and um, then start doing a new model. But you, if you start doing that, you have to go a step further because most likely you might not throw your model completely away. Because, uh, but instead, at some point, you have I don't know ten models, and uh, you realize the one that you're using right now is is, is not fitting anymore. But the uh, old one might might be fitting instead. So how do you decide if you should use a new one or uh, maintain uh, continually updating an, an old one, um, which makes this whole scenario a little bit more 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 trickier. But uh, yeah. Yeah, at that point, if we are having like a different different models, can we use the GMM Gaussian mixture model and give the weightage to according to that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how compatible GMMs are with with GPs. Oh, okay, sure. Um, I, I at least I haven't seen anything in in that uh, direction. And then, uh, I'm. Open to any other questions that students have. I'll ask one more. Um, uh, moving forward, are you gonna do like GPs forever? Like this is the 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 true path, or do you have any interest in different directions? And if so, what what motivates them? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I I think GPs are are very nice for for um this theoretical analysis, and they they offer a lot of opportunities in in that direction. 
but they are certainly not the solution for everything. And especially when it comes to uh, different optimization based approaches, they are, are not ideal because it's in the end you do regression, you directly fit and you cannot uh, optimize uh, a GP in a way that you could optimize a neural network. So when, when thinking, for example, about um, um, Lyapunov functions and, and barrier functions, uh, one big issue is uh, how to, to get them in the first place, especially when you have more, more complicated uh, um, systems. And there, one area is definitely how to, to infer that um, from, from data, uh, where, where, GP, where GPs are, except for maybe a few uh, specific examples, they are not ideal for that. Um, and that's something we've, we've been looking into um, a little bit. Um, another thing that's related to um, to GPs, maybe to some extent, uh, is more general kernel-based learning. Um, again, GPs are a special case of, of that, um, but you can um, formulate optimization pro problems over, over these um, um, spaces that are induced by, by kernels. And that allows you to to get get more flexible again uh, in terms of the problem that you can approach. Um, we've played around with that in the context of uh, inverse reinforcement learning a little bit, uh, where it was a nice uh, tool, but in the end also in terms of scalability a little bit tricky. Um, so there, um, yeah, definitely in this area are are things left to uh, to do. Uh, other questions from students? Uh, if students have follow-on questions, uh, is it okay if I share your email address with them? Yeah, sure, sure. Wonderful, okay, then with that, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope that you get some good sleep. Thank you for staying up so late for us. Thank you, thank you. All right, thanks again. All right. Um, thank you.